All right, here we go. Um, so as Marco mentioned, uh, I'm here to talk to you about how the sharing economy uh, is changing the face of work. And uh, I got a nice intro, but uh, in case you weren't paying attention, um, uh, I got started in the, the sharing economy almost a decade ago. Um, first, as one of the uh, early employees at Kiva.org, uh, a peer-to-peer -peer microfinance lending platform that's sent almost a billion dollars to the developing world. Um, and then I founded Relay Rides, a peer-to-peer -peer car sharing marketplace, um, and uh, I. Hello. Okay, is this better? <laughs> um, and about a year ago, I joined Peers, uh, and we're thinking about how the sharing economy is evolving and who's taking care of, of the worker. So for those of you that don't know uh, the background on Peers, it was started in uh, 2013 uh, to broadly advance the sharing economy. And we were active in our, first, uh, in our first year, mostly in legal and regulatory battles and advocacy. So whenever there was a, uh, a major uh, legal battle, uh, we organized a large community to speak up on, uh, on behalf of those issues. Uh, in doing so, we built um, a community of a quarter of a million people, the world's largest independent sharing economy community. Uh, and when I joined, um, we wanted to look at how we could continue to advance the sharing economy. We, when we spoke to uh, uh, our community, it was clear that uh, the way to advance the sharing economy was to advance the worker. And so now Peers is working to make the sharing economy work for the people that power it. So what does that mean? Uh, it means that we see the sharing economy uh, as an uh, incredible um, development tool. You have literally millions of people earning billions of dollars all around the world, a huge new economic opportunity. But they're doing so outside of the constructs of a traditional job, uh, the benefits and stability that people are used to. They're, they're uh, entrepreneurs for the first time. And many will argue that this work is low wage, no benefit, um, jobs that are exploiting workers. So what is it? You know, we think that the ball's in the air, and it could be tipped in, in either direction. And we're trying to make this into uh, a force that's good for workers. Uh, and this has been a big debate lately. Um, one of the things people are asking is, you know, uh, are, these, uh, are these workers in, uh, employees or independent contractors? This, this work doesn't look like anything we've seen before. And this question has really been thrust into the, the spotlight uh, by a number of lawsuits that are happening uh, in the United States. Um, so uh, there's seven lawsuits where workers are suing the platform saying they've been improperly classified as independent contractors where they should have been employees and they should have gotten the benefits of being an employee. Um, and it's a tough question. Uh, the judge in the, the Lyft case actually he had a great quote. Uh, he said, the jury in this case is going to be handed a square peg and asked to choose between two round holes. This stuff doesn't fit what we're used to. And so we wanted to understand this question a little bit better about independent contractor worker uh, protections. Uh, you know, what do workers really need? And so we spoke to our community. Um, and the first thing we heard was that people were generally really happy with this work. They really loved uh, the income that they could earn. They didn't have a boss. Uh, it's totally flexible. The flexibility was, things, was what people talked the most about. They could earn more in a week or less if they needed to. They could work around their kids' schedule. They could work while they were going to school, use this as a way to transition careers. This is transformational in a lot of people's lives. The downside was um, uncertainty, unpredictability. Um, we heard this when we spoke to people, and then we did a survey with Arun. I'm not sure if Arun is in, is in the room. Um, but um, uh, we asked, what's the biggest challenge of work in the sharing economy? We gave him a, a free form text. And around 30% of people used the words unpredictability, uncertain in their response. So um, you know, this is, you know, they're, they're really empowered by the possibilities, you know, but they're a, little, um, they're a little concerned about it. So let's dive into these issues a little bit more. So um, flexibility, why is this so important? It's important because people are using this for all different reasons. So almost half, or around half of uh, Lyft workers, so uh, Lyft is big in the US, it's not as big in Europe, uh, it's very similar to Uber, um, but uh, around half of the workers only drive for about five hours a week. They're logging on for a couple hours, a, you know, a couple hours a week to earn a couple hundred bucks a month. This is really important for them. Being able to just supplement their income is something that you know, uh, they've come to rely on. 75% of workers uh, cited flexibility as a factor in selecting where to work. This is the number one reason that people uh, considered whenever they're looking at where to work. Higher than, than pay and wages. Only 46% of people um, cited that. Um, and the White House, so this is, um, you know, I'm from the US, so sorry to be um, uh, re referencing those, those things. Um, 
But uh, providing workplace flexibility strengthens families, businesses in our economy. The flexibility that this work represents is incredibly important. And there's real consequences to, uh, uh, to this financial uncertainty. Uh, to pick on Arun again, um, he recently, uh, a couple weeks ago, posted this on his Facebook page. He was getting out of a car and his car got sideswiped. And fortunately, nobody was hurt. Um, and the car is getting, getting repaired. Insurance worked like it was supposed to. But what about this driver? What about the income that they were going to earn uh, while, you know, while their car is in the shop? They, you know, that insurance isn't going to replace lost wages. What about that? So um, I'm going to tell you about a couple of other drivers as well. Um, let's hope this works. <laughs> Ride sharing has a lot of benefits. Um, I, um, I get to set my own hours. I can work as much or as little as I want to work. I've got complete freedom in that regard. But coming with that, there's not as much stability, not as much security as I might otherwise want. I was waiting at a light uh, behind two other cars waiting for the light to change and somebody who wasn't paying attention pulled up behind me and ran into the rear end of my car which pushed me into the car in front of me and pushed that car into the car in front of it. Keep Driving is a program for rideshare drivers whereby if you get involved in an accident you can get a replacement car so you can continue to rideshare so you can keep driving while your own car is repaired. If you get into an accident, insurance is likely going to take care of most of the costs, but insurance policies don't provide for replacement income, for the income that you've lost while you're not driving. I really don't know what I would have done without the Cube Driving program because a week I average around $1,000 of income and since my car has been at the shop for three weeks, I would have lost at least $2,000 to $3,000. The process of getting the car was really easy. I answered a few questions from peers and then the breeze car was delivered to me in uh, less than 24 hours and I was back on the road driving for sidecar in less than 48 hours. Keep driving is really important because you just don't know what's going to happen. So having keep driving there just as a safeguard is, I think, is critical. Uh, so I love the story of these two drivers, of Michael and Malik, two very different workers. Uh, Michael is using is working 20 to 30 hours a week. Uh, this is how he's supporting himself while he's launching a business. Uh, Malig is a researcher. Uh, he's working in cancer research at, uh, at at a university. He turned down a high-paying biotech job because he can work 10 hours a week and use that to support his family. So he can do what he loves and what's best for the world because of this income. Uh, and both of them really were able to continue to support their family because of this uh, because this new program that Piers offered, Keep Driving. Um, so we see Keep Driving, this vehicle replacement product, as a new protection for a new class of worker. And we think that this is just uh, uh, you know, one of many new products uh, that need to be created um, to, uh, to protect workers in a modern context. Um, something that provides benefits, um, yeah, that maintains flexibility. Is, isn't this what we're all looking for? Um, <laughs> um, while reducing financial uncertainty. And so uh, if... Um, these, these lawsuits are asking uh, our workers' uh, employees, but we think this is actually the wrong question. Um, what we think sh people should be asking is, does classifying workers as employees provide flexibility uh, while reducing financial uncertainty? This is what the workers are actually asking us to do. So let's dive into the protections that you get as a worker. So many of the protections that you get as, a, uh, as an employee uh, in the United States came up as a part of the New Deal. Uh, Sarah Horowitz was already talking about this this morning. Uh, the New Deal came out of um, uh, the Depression, and this is how, how we were covered. Um, it led to incredibly important protections. It led to the four-hour work week, 40-hour uh, work week. It led to uh, the rise of the middle class. Um, but it was imagined in a very different time, a very different economy. And it was imagined when people were working you know, really with one job, and they probably were going to stick there for 30 years. Um, and so how do you rethink this uh, in a modern context? What does it even look like? Well, first of all, most workers, you know, not most workers, but most workers in this economy are relying on more than one income stream. So you know, job security is, you know, I like this quote in Fast Company, job security is being replaced by income security. I individuals protect themselves by creating different streams of income. So you have redundancy in your income. You have, um, you have backups in case, uh, in case you need it. And so uh, let's see if these, these old protections actually make sense 
uh, in a modern context. So workers' compensation, this is one of the basic things that everybody gets uh, as an employee. Um, and one of the, the, uh, the biggest benefits that you get from workers' compensation is wage replacement. So if you're injured uh, while you're out, uh, you'll continue to get paid. So what happens when you're only earning 30% of your income through Uber and you get injured in a car accident and you get, uh, the, the replacement is only 30% of your income? Does that help you? I don't think so. That doesn't actually provide the safety and stability that you really need. And also, uh, the current products for work and comp workers' compensation usually have a minimum premium. So that means that there's a minimum cost of, uh, of protecting a worker for, for the platform. So uh, Uber or Lyft or whoever would have to pay a minimum price. Um, I just got a quote looking at this, and it was $1,300 a year for a worker. If a worker worked one hour, they would have to pay $1,300. So depending on the platform, the worker is going to have to work between seven and nine hours a week just to break even on those costs if the platform kept all the, the commissions and, and costs and everything the same. So that means that providing workers' compensation would require the worker probably to work at least 10 hours, but probably more like 20 for it to make, it, for it to make sense for the platform. Um, in order, to, in order to, uh, to work on this platform at all. That's not fitting with, with the narrative of more than half of the workers, right? So this doesn't provide the, um, the financial stability that you need because it's not replacing all of your income. It's eliminating the flexibility that, that you want. Is this helpful? Um, so the other thing that you, that, that you get uh, as an employee, so these aren't guaranteed, but a lot of times you get other types of benefits. So like health insurance, retirement, paid leads, sick days, vacation. Um, these are things that people really love. But you know what? Uh, at least in the United States, uh, the current classifications prevent companies from providing any of these things um, to independent contractors. So if these companies thought they were important, they couldn't provide them. So here we have a new type of work, a new type of worker. And I think, we think that this calls for new legal structures. So independent contractor, employee, uh, these aren't fitting uh, the, the, the current realities of this type of work. So we need to change these, or maybe there's something in the middle. Uh, there's, there's precedent in Canada and Germany for a classification called a dependent contractor. Maybe that's the answer. Maybe there's something in the middle. Either way, I think that we need new legal structure. We need to address what we already have. And we need new protections. Things like keep driving. Things that reimagine the protections that we need to provide financial security while maintaining flexibility. So together, we can do this. So to the platforms, to the, sh uh, to the sharing economy companies, um, protect your workers. Um. <laughs> yeah, sorry. sorry. Hmm. Okay, here we go. We're back. Oh. Okay, so um, uh, there's three parties that uh, that need to work together in order to protect these workers. The platforms, so the Ubers and 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 the Lyfts and TaskRabbits of the world, protect your workers, care about them. Self-regulate. By that I mean, think about the protections that people need in advance. Don't wait until there's a problem. Don't wait until somebody is hurt um, uh, to fix and address these problems. Governments and regulators, fix broken regulations. These things don't work in our modern context. Um, create new regulations if we need them and allow companies to provide benefits to workers. Third parties like peers and the freelancers union and plenty of other you know, brilliant innovators in this room, let's work together. Let's look at, uh, to identify vulnerabilities in a modern context. Let's innovate on current solutions and create new ones as we need to. The ball's in the air right now. There's a question of whether or not this, is, uh, this type of work is going to be a good force in our, in our society and economy or not. Let's work together to tip it in the right direction. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much.